Um, so we can work towards predicting this, these shapes um, based on um, the repulsion. So I mentioned earlier that electrons of the same spin repel each other um, because they're, they have the same charge. And so they don't really like to be um, near each other. And so in order to predict molecular shape, we assume the valence electrons of each atom in the molecule repel one another. When this occurs, the molecule adopts a three-dimensional geometry that minimizes this repulsion where lone pair, lone pair repulsion is greater than lone pair, bond pair, which is greater than bond pair, bond pair. That just basically means that lone pairs really don't like to be beside each other. Uh, lone pairs and bond pairs don't really like to be beside each other. And of the three different types, bond pairs are the sort of the, the one that loses light and just sort of says, well, whatever, everyone else doesn't want to be around here. So, um, they still don't really like to be near each other, so they still repel, but the strength of repulsion is less. Um, and you can, if you think about this, like you, maybe it doesn't make total sense to you right now. Like you're sort of thinking, mm, is what, it, why, why they're all electrons? Why aren't they repelling to the same degree? Well, one of the reasons for it is that in a bonding pair, if we think about it, it's shared between two atoms, right? So if we have a carbon carbon bond like this, where the dash is the bond, the electrons are kind of held in this area between the two carbons. But if we look at our nitrogen in um, ammonia, it has a lone pair on its um, nitrogen in ammonia. This lone pair, it doesn't have that same constraint. It's not like you know, pointing up only to, towards another atom. It can actually fill a much larger space because remember electrons are diffuse from our wave mechanics. Um, they can fill a large area. And so the reason why the lone pair is, has got a greater repulsion is because it can influence a much larger area. Now the governing theory for this is called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, VSEPR. It's a very well-known theory, um, very common. Um, you'll hear about it um, now, you'll hear about it as well in organic chemistry. Um, valence shell electron pair repulsion. So a molecule can be described in terms of the distribution of the bonding atoms about the central atom. And so this is the molecular geometry. So molecular geometry only considers the bonding pairs. It only considers the bonds, the single bonds, the double bonds, the triple bonds. It doesn't care about any lone pairs. But we have another one which does care about lone pairs and bond pairs, and that is electron pair geometry. So it cares about both the bond pairs and the lone pairs by the central atom. So a molecule can be described in terms of the distribution of the bonding pair electrons, BP, and lone pair electrons, LP, about the central atom. And this is called electron pair geometry. So here are some electron pair geometries. Um, we have five on the page. These are sort of the five most common. We have linear, we have trigonal planar, we have tetrahedral, we have trigonal bipyramidal, and we have octahedral. So linear, um, it has uh, only got two electron domains, either bond pairs or lone pairs, and they are sort of um, separated by 180 degrees. So here we have two pairs of electrons. Then for three pairs of electrons, we have a trigonal planar structure. And so this is given the AX3, um, uh, what's the post? Uh, formula where A is the central atom and then X is the atoms which are bonded to it. Um, in the linear case, A was still the central atom and X was these um, bonded atoms. So this is AX2, for an example, is BF2, uh, then uh, our beryllium dichloride. Then here we have um, BF3 as our example. It has a trigonal planar shape. It's called trigonal planar because, well, as you can see, it forms this kind of triangle um, where the um, central atom is here and then X's or bonded atoms are on each of the corners of a triangle. This kind of creates a 120 degree bond angle between each of them, it's the dash line. And this sort of minimizes any repulsion between the different um, electron domains between either the bonding pairs or the lone pairs. 
tetrahedral structures then, so it could be um, this uh, tetrafluoromethane, and they have AX4, where A is, A is still the, the central atom, and then X is these um, bonded atoms. This has um, a bond angle of 109.5, but we already saw that with methane earlier. So uh, this is the tetrahedron I was talking about, the, the nicely drawn one. So um, on each of these corners, we will have an atom, and that will be X. So, and then A will be this circle in the middle, which um, will be our central atom. Uh, so the bond angles here are 109.5. Then trigonal planar, or bi, sorry, trigonal bipyramidal is a trigonal planar structure. So there's like a, you can kind of see a triangle here. So there's a triangle there with um, an atom above and below the ring or below the plane. Um, so we still have A in the middle. This is our central atom. And then we have X's on each of the corners of the triangle and also above and below the plane. This, all right. Um, then A is, is here, of course. There are two, there are, however, now two bond angles. There are the 120 degree angles, which come from our uh, trigonal planar structure, but then there are also 90 degree bond angles, which come from the atoms, which are above and below the plane. And it has a structure here of AX5, and an example of this is PF5. Then we have octahedral, um, that's the last one. So this one is six electron domains. Um, it is a square um, with X's on each of the corner. Um, and then, so it's a square plane plus two, one above and one below with A in the middle. And so the general formula here is AX six. Um, so an example of this would be SF6 that we looked at earlier. Um, you can also see that it's an octahedron, octahedral because it is, forms an octahedron if we look at all of the faces of the structure. Um, so like form a triangle here. That's one face. And then um, you could draw another face here, um, another face here and so on. And so there's a fourth face on the back. You do that for the top and the bottom you get uh, four faces, one on the top and one on the bottom. Four plus four is eight. Eight is octa-octahedron. Um, so that's going back to your, um, what's that, geometry in math mathematics. So in each one of these, we've had electron pair geometries. Conveniently, each of our electron pairs has been bonding pairs in these structures. Um, but the important thing here is that we learn about these five different structures, this linear, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral. These are the five most common, the five that we will need to be familiar with. And so in each case here, we've had central atoms surrounded only by single bond pairs. This is the simplest case, where the electron pair geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. And we'll be considering um, some examples where they're not the same shortly. So if there's any questions about this before we proceed, I would like to hear them. Okay, if there's not, then we can carry on. Okay, so electron domains. So these are regions where it is most probable to find a pair of electrons. So we have two types. We have bonding pairs, um, which are an electron domain. So this is kind of like our carbon, carbon bond, where the electrons are kind of confined to this area between the carbons. And we also have our non-bonding pairs, our electron domains. Also, these are our lone pairs. So for example, the nitrogen in our ammonia had a much larger area of influence for the lone pair. This is a LP, a lone pair. And this is a bonding pair. So the bonding pairs, because they're being shared between two atoms, the two atoms are pulling at them and saying, I want to have both electrons. But of course, they, they kind of outcompete each other and they end up just, um, sharing it instead, and, but it still constrains the electrons to a very specific point in space. Uh, so bonding pairs can be single, double, or triple bonds that all represent just one domain. So um, we can have a carbon-carbon single bond, we could have a carbon-carbon double bond, 
that we could have a carbon carbon triple bond. Um, these are all one domain. Geometry then, so electron domain geometry is an arrangement of electron pairs in space. So this considers both the lone pairs and the bond pairs. So molecular geometry is then the arrangement of atoms in space. Um, so that was what we were looking at earlier with the linear um, trigonal planar uh, tetrahedral, um, octahedral and trigonal bipyramidal. Um, but those structures can also exist for electron domain geometries. Um, but electron domain geometries consider everything, lone pairs and bond pairs. So LP plus BP. But then with molecular geometry, this is just the arrangement of atoms in space. So it only considers the bond pairs. So that means it's possible to have two different types of descriptor, depending on whether we're considering molecular geometry or electron domain geometry. Uh, this is an example of uh, electron domain geometry and you can do it with balloons if you're particularly skilled with balloons i am not so i'll just look at the pictures um so uh linear structures if we have if, well if the balloon artist has their balloons and they can create like a tie in the middle um the two we'll call them lobes um of the balloon so that's one lobe there they will push each other apart so that they are as far apart from each other as possible if there are then three lobes um, like this, we'll get a trigonal planar structure where they try to orientate themselves as far apart as possible. And they have a bond angle of 120 degrees. Um, if we, you can even do this. So if we like try to push this part in this way and this part in this way as well, they will eventually just go back to the original spot. As soon as we release them, as soon as we release the force on them, they'll go back to their natural state, which is the trigonal planar 120 degrees um, separation. Tetrahedral then, if we have four lobes all connected at a single point, the single point is here, um, they will have 109.5 degrees between each lobe. And if we do the same thing, if we like grabbed a couple of them and try to push them together, sure, they'll push together initially whenever we are holding them. But if we stop holding them, um, they will bounce back to this tetrahedral structure. Um, same with trigonal bipyramidal, you can see that it is um, a trigonal planar structure combined with a linear structure. Here's the trigonal planar structure here, like that, and then the planar structure or the linear structure there. And so they all go through this central point here. And this is the best arrangement of all five groups to minimize the sort of propulsion between the balloons. And then octahedral is just a collection of three linear uh, balloon uh, arc hard things. I don't know how to describe them. Um, but basically, this three linear things together creates a tetrahedral arrangement for each at bond angle is 90 degrees. Um, that minimizes the forces as much as possible. Um, and we end up with the octahedral electron domain geometry. It could also be molecular geometry as well. So valence shell electron pair repulsion theory is something that has driven most of this. Um, electron domains repel each other because the electrons of the same spin don't like to be near each other. The space between electron domains is maximized as much as possible. Um, the electron domains will be equally spread out amongst um, the available space around the central atom A. Electron domain geometries. Um, okay, we got the six balloons. We have octahedral, five balloons, tetrahedral, our trigonal bipyramidal, four balloons tetrahedral, three balloons trigonal planar, two balloons linear. So we just replace here balloons with um, electron domains and we get the same thing. Okay. So molecular geometry is for five electron pairs. So we'll look at these then in some detail. So these are all based on the trigonal bipyramidal shape, like so. Um, the trigonal bipyramidal shape is here. So we can see the triangle shape here, going like this. And then the atoms above and below the plane. So the ones that are in the 
triangle are called equatorial atoms because they're on the equator of this structure. And then the axial atoms are on the axes of the um, structure. And so they're called axial atoms. Imagine the earth has an equator that goes around the middle. So too does this structure have three atoms which go around the middle. And so they're called the equatorial atoms. The ones above and below are called the axial atoms. Okay. So these are all based on a trigonal bipyramidal shape because they have five electron pairs. These don't necessarily all have to be bond pairs though. They can also be lone pairs. So in the case where we have five bond pairs and no lone pairs, we will have a trigonal bipyramidal structure. An example of that is PF5. These thick lines here are the, um, the bonds. If we then remove one of those bonds um, and replace it instead with a lone pair, we still have five electron pairs. So four plus one is still five. Um, we still have five here. Just this time now we have a lone pair. Now our electron domain geometry, our electron pair geometry, it's still trigonal bipyramidal. For all four of these structures, it will always be trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry or electron domain geometry. However, the molecular geometry has changed because the molecular geometry only considers the bonding pairs. So um, we have four bonds here. Uh, you can see from the thick black lines, one, two, three, four. And then we have a dashed line here, which indicates the uh, lone pair. And so our structure here is a seesaw structure, um, a seesaw structure, because if we turn it on its side, you'll see that it kind of represents, oh, that's a terrible drawing. Wait a minute. Let's see if I can do it better. Ooh, not much better, a bit better. Okay, so then um, kind of looks like a seesaw that you might see in a playground. So you put a person here. Um, and then another person here. Now we have a seesaw, but a seesaw with a lone pair. Um, and so uh, this is why it's called a seesaw structure. Uh, it also has some other names, but those are not as, as um, evocative. Then um, CLF3, um, this is a T-shaped structure. So you can kind of see it's T-shaped on its side again. Um, you see it's got two lone pairs and then it's got uh, three bond pairs, which are the thick lines. So that still adds up to five, right? three plus two is five. Uh, it still has this trigonal bipyramidal electron pair or electron domain geometry. And then linear structures are also possible with this. So the linear structure here, it's just a line, uh, xenon difluoride, it has two bond pairs, three lone pairs, it still has five electron domains, which means it still has this trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry. Um, but this time we have one, two, three lone pairs plus two bond pairs. And we have a linear structure with 180 degrees between the bonding pairs, like so. Okay. Um, an example of this then would be PCL5, um, which we just looked at in PF5. So phosphorus has five valence electrons, which means it can share up to five of those. Um, and then it can form five bonds to chlorine. So this is the Lewis structure here in the middle. It doesn't really tell us much about the structure. Um, but does tell us that there are five bonds. Five electron domains makes us think what? Makes us think trigonal bipyramidal. Um, in this case, we don't have any lone pairs. We only have bond pairs. And so we will have the same molecular geometry and electron pair geometry, um, both of which are trigonal bipyramidal. Um, so phosphorus is five valence electrons. Each chlorine atom needs one electron to complete its octet because remember chlorine is group 7A. Um, so it has seven electrons already. It needs one more to make eight. And then um, it'll be happy. Um, SF4 then. So this is the seesaw structure for the molecular geometry. Um, sulfur has six valence electrons. Each fluorine atom being in group seven, it needs one electron to fill its octet. Um, so sulfur here with its six um, electrons, um, four of them become bonding bonding pairs and one of them is a lone pair. So we have 10 valence electrons. 
five groups. So we have four bond pairs and one lone pair. We form this seesaw shape. Um, here's the lone pair here. Um, the electron domain geometry though, or electron pair geometry is still trigonal bipyramidal. There's still our five groups here. There's still our, this one, four plus one is still equal to five. That hasn't changed. Um, but now we have a different molecular geometry because molecular geometry only cares about the bond pairs or the actual bonds. It only cares about where the bonds are happening. So there are four bonds here, which means that we don't have a trigonal bipyramidal molecular geometry. We now have instead a seesaw molecular geometry. Electron domain geometries, molecular geometries, trying to sort of rationalize the two in terms of um, how they interacted with like bonding pairs and lone pairs, how um, electron domain geometries kind of looked at, so I'll just call electron domain geometries EDG, so I don't have to write it all out. But electron domain geometries, they considered the geometry of all the sort of electron groupings or electron pairs around the central molecule. So they included the lone pairs and the bonding pairs. The bonding pairs um, could be single, double, or triple bonds, didn't matter. Um, those were all just still one electron domain. And then the molecular geometry Mg, or molecular geometry, uh, only really considers the bonding areas. So like the bonding pairs, again, there's no distinction made between single, double, and triple bonds. Um, we talked about five uh, electron pair molecular geometries. Um, so this one is going to be the Six electron pair molecular geometries, um, typically based on the octahedral structure. Um, the reason why it's called octahedral is because it sort of has this octahedron type structure um, associated with it. So there's eight sides to this. So there's two pyramids attached to each other. Uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're going to be putting our molecules on the corners of this, or sorry, our atoms on the corner of this um, octahedron. Um, these, well, electron pairs actually, um, are going to be their lone pairs or bonding pairs. Um, A is going to be the one in the middle. It's just a typical notation. This A is the central atom and then the ones around it are X's. So for um, six electron pairs, the electron pair geometry um, in these three molecular geometries down below, they are always going to be octahedral. Um, if we have six bond pairs, this is going to be the, the simplest case. Um, we have an octahedral system where um, each of these green spheres represents a, a fluorine in this case, and the uh, central atom is a sulfur. And we look a little bit about at the SF6 Lewis structure before and how that can be formed. But these fluorines will go on each of the corners of this octahedron. If we then remove one of these uh, bonding pairs, we can get a lone pair. So we put in a lone pair as this dash bond here. We get a square pyramidal structure where the, um, or sorry, molecular geometry called square pyramidal. So it's, if I draw, if I connect all of the um, green spheres together, all of the fluorines again, um, hopefully you'll be able to see that it forms a pyramid. And that's where that sort of, um, structure comes from, or the, the name for the structure comes from. Um, we don't include the lone pair in our um, decision making whenever we're considering the molecular geometry, but the electron pair geometry still considers it um, as being there. Um, that's because, well, the lone pair is still there. It still exists. It's still possible for things to happen there. If ever we have a reaction or something, it could happen there. Um, then square planar is whenever we remove um, two of the, the bond pairs from the octahedral case. And so we have um, a lone pair on the bottom and on the top. The reason why they're on the bottom and the top and not, for example, on the sides or something is because this um, minimizes the repulsion between them. You remember from our VSEPR theory, um, lone pair, lone pair repulsion was the most or was the, the strongest followed by our lone pair bond pair. So lone pair, lone pair was the strongest repulsion and then lone pair bond pair and then bond pair bond pair. So this means that the, the best way to sort of minimize this repulsion or this these repulsive energies is just by putting them um, to one side. 
or putting them on different sides. So they're as far apart from each other as is possible in this structure. They're 180 degrees apart. So it's about 180 degrees. Okay. Um, so this just sort of minimizes the energy, makes everything a little bit happier. Um, so that's the square planar, square pyramidal, octahedral. They all have six electron pairs and they have all have an octahedral electron pair geometry, but they may have different molecular geometries. And this is kind of one of the things that needs to be stressed is that molecular geometries and electron domain geometries, although they can um, be describing the same um, system, they take into account different things. So compounds with five or six. So here we have it in somewhat more detail. Um, we have the octahedron, this SF6. We put, um, this is sort of like the, the S in the middle and the P orbitals all overlapping coming from this sulfur, um, central sulfur atom. And then the fluorines attached to it on the outside. Um, these are all 90 degrees apart. We have six, six electron pairs, six bond pairs. Um, we have an octahedral electron domain geometry and an octahedral molecular geometry. So in order to predict molecular or ion shape, we first write out the Lewis structure. Um, that's something that we've, we've done extensively. And um, we count the number of electron domains around the central atom to determine the arrangement, minimizing repulsion. So this is part of that BSEPR. It's why this, the, um, the xenon complex earlier in the octahedral electron domain geometry examples was, um, square planar. So the BSEPR needs to be considered the valence shell electron pair repulsion. Um, so that's this minimizing repulsion is from the BSEPR. Um, electron domains, that's either a bond pairs or um, lone pairs. Um, but uh, it doesn't really worry too much about whether it's a single bond, double bond, or triple bond. Those are all just still one uh, domain. Describe the molecular geometry in terms of the arrangement of the bonding domains then. So remember we're minimizing the repulsion. So we're trying to just uh, distribute them around the central atom in some way. And then double and triple bonds are counted as one domain for determining molecular shape. So remember that when predicting shapes of molecules with double or triple bonds, that for the ESEPR model, sorry, BSEPR model, multiple bonds count as one effective electron pair. The influence of lone pairs around an atom. So lone pairs require more room than bonding pairs and tend to compress the angles between the bonding pairs. So what happens here is like, for example, if we have um, ammonia, uh, ammonia is NH3, like so. The nitrogen here has a lone pair. And now you can determine that from its Lewis structure quite easily. Now, what happens is that um, whilst most of, like, for example, these, uh, nitrogen hydrogen bonds. These are covalent bonds. Covalent bonds mean that one electron comes from each atom and that they're shared. Um, they're both pulling on these um, electrons. And so what happens is that the electrons are kind of localized in a line between the, along the bond axis between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. So you kind of draw a line between these two nuclei. That's more or less where most of the electron density is going to be, where the most probable place of finding the electrons will be. But in the case of lone pairs, they don't have this other atom pulling on them. Um, they're kind of a lot freer in their positioning. So they can occupy a much larger space. So that's what this means. Lone pairs require more room than bonding pairs and tend to compress the angles between the bonding pairs. Why do they compress the angles between the bonding pairs? Well, that's due to this VSEPR theory as well, that these um, lone pairs, because they're not sort of being... Um, utilized in bonding, they're really just pushing on the other parts of the molecule. They're trying to get as much space as possible. They're trying to be more diffuse. They're trying to occupy their full orbital. They don't have some other thing to do, which would be to be shared between um, two atoms. And so this, this big red sort of mushroom cloud is just um, a sort of a visual representation of some of that um, electron density from the lone pair. So um, how does this then influence our uh, molecular geometry? Well, as I as it said there, it compresses this angle. So if we take a look at the electron pair geometries for tetrahedral structures, so those are four electron pairs. If we look at 
uh, methane here on the left hand side, we have four bond pairs. We have one, two, three, four CH bonds with four bond pairs, no lone pairs. And we have a perfect tetrahedral angle of 109.5. Now, if we replace one of those bond pairs with a lone pair, what ends up happening is that this lone pair, as, I've, as I mentioned earlier, which being more diffuse, taking up more space, um, pushes the bond pairs away because the electrons repel each other. Well, electrons of the same spin will repel each other. And so these electrons push on the repel um, the bond pairs. And so um, because the bond pairs aren't able to repel each other as strongly as the lone pairs can repel the bond pairs, then what happens is it lowers this angle down. And so this angle gets uh, smaller to 107.5 degrees. And it's due to the influence of this lone pair, which doesn't really have anything else better to do except to push other things away from it, uh, at least in, a, in, a, in an isolated molecule. And then we can see that that sort of trend continues. If we then look at water, which has um, two bond pairs and two lone pairs, it has this angle of 104.5 degrees. And it has this molecular structure of bent. So the, there's two lone, lone pairs and they repel each other. And then after that, they then repel the bond pairs and then the bond pair, bond pair, they just get pushed together because their strength of repulsion is less than the strength of the lone pairs because, well, they're involved in bonding. So their electrons are less free to move around. They occupy less space. They're kind of just in this area here, something like that. So the, the bond angles, so here we go, it's all summarized. So zero lone pairs, we have a perfect tetrahedral um, angle. Um, whenever we have one lone pair, the angle becomes less. Um, and then whenever we have two lone pairs, it gets even smaller. And we have different, these are the molecular geometries over here. Okay, so the main takeaway here is that we're thinking about um, combining these uh, molecular geometries that we've learned um, with um, our understanding of BSEPR theory um, in its rudimentary state. Um, we're trying to rationalize that by pushing down on um, the bonding pairs, the lone pairs are exerting their influence and they're reducing that bond angle. So as lone pairs, as the number of lone pairs, number of lone pairs increases, then the, uh, the angle, the bond angle decreases. Okay, so draw the Lewis structure of phosphorus pentachloride. So if I have, what is the molecular formula of phosphorus pentachloride, anyone wanna guess? How many phosphoruses, how many chlorides? All right, I got some answers. You're all right. Okay, yep, all right, good job. So phosphorus pentachloride is indeed P penta, pentagon five, a pentachloride, PCL five. All right, very good. Um, phosphorus then is in, group, I always forget this, group five, I think. Uh, It is indeed in group five. Okay, so phosphorus is in group 5A. Um, and then chlorine, here you just doubt yourself. You're like, I know it's in 5A, but is it? But anyway, um, so there's seven A, chlorines in 7A. All right, so um, this means that um, phosphorus has five valence electrons and how many valence electrons will chlorine have? Can someone tell me? Just the valence electrons, total valence electrons, total valence electrons, not charge of chlorine. All right, seven is the answer because it's in group seven. Um, just the veal, just looking at the valence because we're doing the Lewis structure here, so we need the valence electrons. So we have one phosphorus, so that's five electrons. And then um, we have five chlorines, so five times seven electrons. 
five times seven is 35. So we have a total of 40 electrons. Okay. Then we do add our, our classic um, least electronegative atom, which would be the phosphorus in this case. It's our central atom. Uh, put the chlorines out. We don't really know the structure yet. So just so long as the um, phosphoruses and chlorides are bonded together, that's enough at this point. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five. Five bonds, which means I have to subtract how many electrons from my 40? How many electrons are there in five bond pairs? All right, very good. It is indeed 10. That was easier than the valence electrons. Um, so subtract 10 electrons. So we have 30 remaining. So the next step is to distribute these 30 electrons as lone pairs on the um, terminal atoms, which is the chlorines. So conveniently we have here, um, so six on each chlorine, um, because that gives it a full octet. Um, conveniently we have five, so six times five is 30. So this will use up all of our remaining electrons, um, which gives us um, five electron domains around the phosphorus all of which are bonding pairs. So that means our electron domain geometry is going to be the same as our molecular geometry. Uh, the next slide, if I recall correctly, will ask us to draw out the structure. Um, so yeah, so minus 30, what was, um, minus 30 electrons gives us zero electrons. All right. So yeah, so the electron domain geometry is equal to the molecular geometry. Um, it's gonna be trigonal bipyramidal. So there's our Lewis structure here, and then asks us to draw out a 3D picture of phosphorus pentachloride. So something like this would suffice. So this wedge arrow here, this filled in wedge arrow means that the atom that will be at the end of that bond, which will be chlorine, will be coming towards us out of the screen. Um, and then this dashed line, this is harder to draw on a screen, um, is going to be going away from us, it's going to be going into the screen. So this is the structure here. Um, it's just based on our knowledge that there are five electron domains. And we learned about the types of structures that um, were present for those um, earlier. So the reason why these structures form is just to try and distribute those um, bond pair repulsion forces as far apart from each other as possible. And so it turns out that um, this is the best uh, sort of option for all of them. It leaves us with um, the lowest repulsion between the bond pairs. Uh, this angle is about 90, and this angle is about 120. Um, degrees. So the atoms here that, um, let me see if I get a different pan color. Uh, let's make it blue. So the atoms here in the blue triangle um, kind of look, if we remove the, the chlorines above and below, kind of look like the trigonal planar structure. Um, but they're also called um, equatorial atoms. Equatorial? Yeah, equatorial. Um, so those are uh, equatorial atoms, and then the ones above and below those are axial. Um, this is kind of because if we think of like this, the world as a sphere, it has the equator that goes around the middle and then it has the axes which go above and below. So that's kind of where it comes from. Same sort of principle. Yes, Andrew? But sir, what happens if we have, let's say, a molecule with a central atom and six, is that right? Uh, six other atoms radiating from the up, up, down, left, right, front, and back. Would that be like, wouldn't it have like um, three axial 
so all the items on will be axial except for the center one. That's not what I mean. It, hang on. Um, there, so there's six atoms attached to it. Like sure a that. octahedral shape. Hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be like, wouldn't all the atoms on uh, attached atoms on be axial because like they Good all have an, they all have an axis to them, like an X axis, a Y axis, and a Z axis. Hmm. If they're all the same, then there's no distinction to be made um, in the case of an octahedral. Um, it only matter, like this is somewhat more advanced than the cases that we'll be doing, but um, it is possible for them to be axial and equatorial. Um, but it, yeah, if they're all the same, like if it's SF6, for example, for all of the attached atoms are the same, then it's hard to distinguish which one is axial and which one is equatorial. And um, you're right about that. Um, it usually only because, I mean, you'd look at it from any angle and you say which one's axial and which one's equatorial. But um, whenever we have uh, differences, like for example, if we have um, not like an AX4 and then a uh, a B2 or something. We have like, for example, different numbers of, or different types of atoms attached to the central atom. That's when it's possible to distinguish. But if, for example, um, actually, I think we're gonna draw SF6 in a minute, so I can talk about it there as well. But if, for example, we have this um, octahedral structure, uh, that's not very good. You can still technically say that these, the ones that I'm drawing first here, are um, equatorial, but it would be hard to like um, distinguish between them experimentally because they're identical to the ones that are above and below. And because we can like, and it can be hard to visualize sometimes, but if we like, we can rotate the, the structure and it still looks the same because all the bond lengths are the same and the bond angles are all the same. But um, strictly speaking, the way that I've drawn this, um, these atoms would be equatorial and the ones above and below would be axial. Um, but yeah, as Andrew points out, like um, it's, it's hard to distinguish between these. Um, especially in a case like this, where all of the bonded atoms are exactly the same. If for example, we had um, a complex, which was AX, to Y4, for example, where we've changed um, two of them. So for example, if we change this to X and X, just for sake of argument, that's when it would be a lot easier to determine because the axial atoms, which are along this line here, a lot by the middle, they are suddenly different. Um, so it's a lot easier to tell in that case. But yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it's certainly a valid point, and it is something that comes up. But right now, for this class, we don't really need to con worry ourselves too much about this somewhat more complicated example. Um, but we do need to understand that in this um, this system here, this um, five electron domain system, that we can have equatorial and axial um, atoms, and the, it is possible to tell these apart because they have different angles between them. Um, so even like um, experimentally, you can differentiate between these two. Um, it also, they also end up having somewhat different reactivities as well. Just because like a lot of chemical reactivity depends on how accessible something actually is because a lot of this is based on size and shape. So if something can't actually access something else, it, it won't fit there. If you think about a, a parking space, um, a regular parking space doesn't really fit at most large trucks very well. You can't fit a truck in there. So like um, the same sort of thing happens with uh, an atom. If, it, if, it's, if the space around it is too small and it doesn't fit, then it won't react. It's just not possible. There's gotta be some sort of um, space. Um, all right, that seems to get out of, uh, a little bit out of what I intended to talk about. So, um, okay, next one is, yeah, did we just go straight from, I think it wants us to do the Lewis structure here, the PCL uh, four, don't know what happened there. Anyway, um, so phosphorus again is in group 5A, 
chlorine is in group 7A. That's kind of hard to see, the green. It's not as good as the red. All right, so, um, so we have five electrons, seven times four is 28. Um, 33, but then we have this plus sign, which means what do we do to our electron count if we have a, a positive charge? What does that mean? All right, yeah, very good. Um, so don't worry about that straight line. That was my mistake. So we subtract an electron because a positively charged ion um, means that we have a deficiency of an electron, which means that we have one electron less than we should have. So then we have um, phosphorus in the middle. We just draw out our sort of rough skeleton structure here for our Lewis structure. Um, Doesn't need to be exact because we're not trying to draw out the structure just yet. So um, we have 32 electrons. Um, we have four bond pairs, so that's eight electrons being used up. Gives us uh, a remaining number of 24. Is going to be three lone pairs in each of the chlorines. So that's six electrons. Six electrons times four is 24 which uses up all our electrons, which means that our phosphorus has no extra electron domains. It is It has four bond pairs, but don't forget our charge. Usually we denote the charge on these sorts of complex ions as a square bracket around the, the drawing and then uh, put the charge in the top right-hand corner. So this is a, a plus one ion. So we add the uh, plus here. Um, the structure here is most likely going to be tetrahedral if nothing else changes, um, because we have four bond pairs, uh, no lone pairs. So our again, our electron domain geometry and our molecular geometry are going to be the same. So there's somewhat nicer drawing of that than what I did. Uh, draw the 3D picture. So most likely it's going to be uh, based on just what we know, um, it's most likely going to be something like this, which will be a tetrahedral structure. We're not told anything else. Like there's nothing, we, we haven't been informed of any lone pairs. Um, the only structure we really know that has, um, what do you call this? That has a four electron domain geometry is, the tetrahedral shape. That's the only shape that we've been told about so far. So this is the only shape that we can really consider as being valid. Um, it also kind of looks a little bit about a little bit like the PCL5. I mean, it's not exactly the same, obviously, but if we drew a structure like a, an atom down here, it kind of looks a bit like the PCL5 a bit. So um, it's not too far away. So it's not so bad. Um, but yeah, something like tetrahedral geometry. Uh, you draw. Okay, draw the list structure of PCL6. All right, we're going to be doing all these structures. Um, phosphorus then, uh, group five again. Chlorine is going to be group seven. There are six of them which means we have six times seven is 42. Um, what happens whenever I have a negatively charged ion? What happens to my Lewis electron count? 37. Yep. All right, very good. Add an electron. Good job. So we have 48 electrons. Um, do the same thing then. So phosphorus in the middle, um, our chlorines, all the way around. So we have here six bond pairs, which means that we will have how many bonding electrons? Yep, 12 is the answer. So that's gonna be 36 
Um, we have six chlorines. Um, conveniently, again, these are all worked out. Um, of course, to be perfect examples for the class. Um, they are going to be distributed onto each of the chlorines like so. So six times six is 36. That conveniently gets rid of all of our lone pair electrons. And so we end up just with um, six electron domains, which are also six bonding pairs. Don't forget about um, our proper notation of our charge. Um, so this means that our electron domain geometry and our molecular geometry are going to be the same again. And so we'll end up with something like this. Uh, draw the 3D picture then. So anyone want to guess what our um, structure might be? Um, we have six bond pairs, no lone pairs. Yeah, very good. All right, good job. The structure is indeed going to be octahedral. All right, something like this. Um, Oh my goodness, please excuse my terrible drawing on this screen. All right, so don't forget the charge. It's gonna be minus. Um, sometimes I like to draw it out a little bit different, like so like, um, it's still octahedral of course, but because sometimes these wedges can be a pain to draw. Um, you can also draw the structure a bit like this. Um, I'm not drawing the chlorines. Um, the reason why you can do this is because if you imagine that um, if you kind of partially rotate, um, we'll get a different color. If you partially rotate this structure here on the left, um, if you imagine there's kind of like a a mirror plane which exists through this part, which it takes in this bond, this bond, and this bond, and this bond. Then the only ones that stick out from that plane are the, the ones here and here. Um, so those ones do not, so those have to stick out. So that's this bond and this bond. Um, it just is an easier way to draw it. Um, it's still technically an octahedral structure. It's just kind of like, you change the perspective a bit. Plus it's a lot easier to draw. Um, because a straight line is easier to draw than those wedges. Um, it won't really matter so much because like with all the exams and stuff being multiple choice, you won't actually really have to draw any of these out. Um, but you will have to be able to recognize them and understand what they are. Especially whenever you go on to um, later chemistry classes, whichever ones you're required to do. Okay, draw the Lewis structure of xenon tetrafluoride. So xenon tetrafluoride, what is, what is my sort of... Um, Molecular formula is going to be. Anyone want to help me out? Would it be um, XEF4? That's right, XEF4. So it's going to be XE. Those of you who also messaged in the chat, you all got it right as well. So good job. Um, XEF4. Um, so uh, xenon is in group eight. It means it has eight um, electrons. So xenon is about the only one of the noble elements which actually reacts, and it typically only re reacts with fluorine. Um, but once you react it with fluorine, you can also react it with other things, but it's generally very limited to what it can do. So uh, fluorine is in group seven. Um, there are four of them. So that's going to be 28. So um, we have here 36 as our total number of electrons. Um, xenon is less electronegative than fluorine. Um, we we're gonna actually cover electronegativity um, maybe today. I don't know if we'll get it started, but at least it's, it's in the pipeline. It'll be the next thing taught after this, once we're done with all these structures. 
So we have uh, four bond pairs, so that's eight electrons. So that's going to be 28. Um, so then we put our lone pairs as usual. Like so. Okay, so that's um, six, 12, 18, 24. Oh, it's not perfect anymore. We now have four electrons remaining. Um, so we put those on the central atom. So this means that we now have two um, lone pairs and four bond pairs. Um, so I'm gonna ask you now um, what my electron domain geometry is going to be. <laughs> yes, that's not, you're right, you're right. You've got the molecular geometry already. Um, some of you have answered already with the molecular geometry, so that's very good. But I wanna know also the um, electron domain geometry. So what's my electron domain geometry gonna be? If I have six electron domains. Some of you are getting very excited there, which is good. It's good. I like it. It's good. Um, so yeah, so the electron domain geometry is going to be octahedral. Um, we have six electron domains, so it's octahedral. Um, the um, and you're all, some of you are also right that the molecular geometry is going to be square planar. Based on what we saw earlier, it's the very first thing we did today. Uh, So this, remember, this is whenever we think about um, molecular geometry only considers the um, actual bonds which exist, whereas um, electron domain geometry considers everything. All right, there's our Lewis structure, very good. Um, same as, well, similar to what I drew it. And you can also, oh, well, sorry, already see they've actually kind of indicated what the structure is going to be. They've drawn everything in a square. So draw a 3D picture of xenon tetrafluoride. So again, um, Xenon in the middle, and we draw a wedge going out like that. This one like this, then do 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 do. Draw out our fluorines on the four corners of our square. Very strange looking square. This, um, and then we can also draw in our lone pairs there. So we have our 3D picture of fluorine with its strange looking square, something like that. So it's gonna be square plane. All right, now we get to talk about electronegativity finally. So um, we've talked, about, talked a bit about this and I've just kind of told you that um, a very hand wavy way that um, the most electronegative is uh, fluorine. And as we go across and down, um, and sort of the group number decreases. So the higher the group number, the more electronegative um, if it's in the same row. And then usually those that are towards the top are more electronegative than those towards the bottom. But technically it's true, um, generally. So what we see is um, things like the fluorine is by definition the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. But what does electronegativity mean? It really means like how how much a particular atom is going to pull electrons towards itself in a covalent bond. So remember a covalent bond is um, whenever two atoms come together to share an electron or share a pair of electrons. So one comes from each in our conventional covalent bond. Um, whenever something involves fluorine um, or involves a different, like two different atoms. So for example, if we have like hydrogen and fluorine or we have fluorine and um, I don't know, carbon or something. Um, they pull the electrons with different um, strengths. Um, and so this means that there's going to be um, in the bond, the bond is kind of like, um, say it's carbon and fluorine. So it means that what's going to happen is that they're going to be, because fluorine is more electronegative, more of the electrons are going to be on the fluorine side. Um, of course, they still go the whole way to carbon. Carbon still has access to them. Otherwise, the bond would not form. But um, because of fluorine's ability to pull the electrons more, the density or probability of the electrons is going to be more towards the fluorine side. 
Electronegativity is generally given the, the Greek letter chi. This looks like an X, but usually you draw it like that. So it's like kind of like a, I don't really know how to describe what I just did, but that's basically how we usually write it out. And this is what it looks like if it's typed. So recall that electronegativity measures the relative tendency for an atom to polarize a bond. Polarize just really means that one side becomes negative, the other side becomes more positive. And it follows the um, effective nuclear charge on the periodic table. Um, yeah. So generally what you see as well is that those with um, higher electron affinities um, generally are more electronegative. So on this side of the periodic table here on the right-hand side, so groups three to seven, what we tend to see is that these all want to gain electrons. And so um, especially up here, they want to gain electrons. So they're more electronegative, but it makes sense. You know, These are typically our negative ions. So fluorine often becomes fluoride, oxygen often becomes oxide and so on. So these are, um, it, all, it makes sense that they can pull electrons towards themselves very well. Uh, whereas things over here, like lithium, sodium, those generally become our cations, like lithium ion, sodium ion, uh, Li plus, Na plus. So it makes sense that they don't really like electrons so much because they generally want to form positive ions, which have a deficiency of electrons. So there, there is some like connection between all of these things. And, and generally, that's, that's not, nothing really exists in isolation in chemistry. There's usually interconnectivity between most of it. So yeah, so recall that electronegativity chi measures the relative tendency for an atom to polarize a bond. It follows Z effective on the periodic table. So electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract electrons to itself. Um, so this is interrelated also with ionization energy, which is the measure of how hard an atom holds onto its electrons or how well it holds those electrons. Um, electron affinity then is a measure of how strong an atom attracts electrons to itself. So the higher the electron affinity, the more electronegative it's going to be. Fluorine has a very high electron affinity, so it's, it's, going, it's very good at holding electrons. Now generally how we use these uh, electronegativities is by determining the electronegativity difference. And um, here it's called delta En. You'll generally see it more commonly as delta chi. Um, that'll be seen more regularly. Um, these, this number scale was created by a scientist called Linus uh, Pauling. So it's usually called Pauling electronegativity. Um, the differences in electronegativity also influence sort of like the um, types of bonds that occur. So generally, whenever the electronegativity difference is very small, so somewhere between zero and 0 0.5, we have a non-polar bond because the both of the atoms kind of pull the electrons to the same extent. They're not really any major difference. And so we have this kind of non-polar bond. And so whenever we have atoms of the same type, like for example, uh, HH, uh, H2 or CLCL, CL2, um, they are the same element. They pull the electrons to exactly the same amount. And so there is a zero electronegativity difference and so it is completely non-polar. The electrons exist equally along the length of the bond. Like there's no, like if I can draw it kind of equally, something like that, like the, the bonds are not polarized in any way. Whereas if we look at HCl, um, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so if this red line indicates the electron cloud or the probability of finding electrons, it's going to be skewed towards the chlorine because the chlorine is actually delta negative, not gamma, this is a mistake, um, and delta positive, which is the hydrogen. These are polar covalent bonds. The electrons are still shared, albeit they are shared um, in a way which means that the chlorine in this instance has more of the electrons than the hydrogen does. But the hydrogen still has access to two electrons, and so we say that it is so fulfilled its, its duet, its two electrons, and so it's still fairly happy. But it just means that this is this part here on the chlorine is somewhat negative, and this part on the hydrogen is somewhat positive. And then um, as we sort of go beyond 1.7, sort of 1.8, we enter the realm of ionic bonds um, where electrons are completely transferred. And so sodium chloride is our prototypical example. Table salt um, has 
chlorine has taken an electron from sodium. Um, sodium has gotten rid of an electron. Both of them have um, filled octets. Both of them have um, a stable structure and are quite happy to exist as ions. And then they come together and form ionic bonds because this minimizes the, the, um, the problem of having a charge imbalance. And so the positive sodium and the negative chlorine are attracted to each other and they form an ionic complex. Okay, so that's the electronegativity difference scale. We'll talk about this more. Um, polar covalent bonds, electrons may not be shared equally. Um, this is based on the electronegativity difference between the two elements forming the bond. So that's our HCl in the previous example. If the difference is equal to zero, we have a purely covalent bond. If the difference is going to be uh, greater than 1.7, we have an ionic bond. And then values between zero and 1.7 are polar covalent. So um, examples of um, uh, purely covalent are like the ones we saw on the previous slide, H2, um, can also be oxygen, O2, can also be um, nitrogen, N2, and so on. Um, the difference then, um, chlorine, uh, fluorine, those ones, those are all uh, non-polar covalent. Then greater than 1.7, sodium chloride, um, magnesium oxide, stuff like that. And then values between zero and 1.7 are polar covalent. Electrons are not shared equally. So that's like uh, HF. Or we can also have um, even CF bonds or carbon hydrogen bonds. Those are all polar to some extent. Uh, but actually, um, there is like some interesting behavior between these two because if we look at the electronegativities, we find that um, in this CF bond, because fluorine is the most electronegative, always remember if you remember nothing here, um, the, the most important thing is to remember that fluorine is the most electronegative. And then moving away in the periodic table from fluorine, it is um, less electronegative. So the further you get from fluorine, the less electronegative you are. So if you imagine you go like fluorine and then oxygen and then uh, nitrogen. So it, those are getting less electronegative and carbon, boron and so on. And also if you go down, so fluorine to chlorine, chlorine is less electronegative than um, fluorine and then bromine and iodine. And then also moving in like down into the left and stuff. Basically fluorine is the most electronegative. And after that, everything else is not as electronegative. Um, so in this case, uh, we actually have a situation where um, carbon is delta positive, but in the carbon hydrogen bond, you can, if you like look up the electronegativity table on the previous slide, you can actually calculate this for yourself. We find that in the CH bond, carbon is actually delta negative and hydrogen is delta positive. So depending on, on like what it's bonded to, things can be either electron rich or electron poor. And this will become much more important for you if you do organic chemistry, but uh, it's, still, it's still kind of an interesting thing that can happen that um, it's not always that it's always delta negative. It's not always that it's always delta positive. Uh, let's just add that. Let's see. All right, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about it again next time as well. Uh, electronegativity tells us how much a particular atom wants electrons. So fluorine really wants electrons. So it is the most electronegative. Electronegativity increases left to right across a period. So lithium is less electronegative than boron, which is less electronegative than oxygen, which is less electronegative than fluorine. Then going down, like fluorine is um, more electronegative than chlorine. Chlorine is more electronegative than bromine. That's going down uh, group seven. A molecule with no polar bonds is a non-polar molecule. So that's our H2. Um, uh, a molecule with one polar bond is uh, a polar molecule. So that's like our HF. If, in, if the individual bond dipoles do not cancel, the molecule is said to be polar. If the individual bond dipole do cancel, um, the molecule is non-polar. And if there are lone pairs on the central atom, the molecule is 
most likely going to be polar unless they cancel each other out. So we'll learn about this idea of cancellation of the dipoles next time. But basically it means that like if we have the classic example is carbon dioxide, um, where the carbon oxygen bonds are polar. So carbon in this instance is delta positive and then oxygen is delta negative. Um, but then the other oxygen is also delta negative. So what happens is that um, the polarity, so like, remember we talked about how this um, electronegativity indicates how much an electron can pull electrons towards itself. So um, if you think about it like this, something like this, the magnitude of this pulling in both directions is the same. So what ends up happening is that there is no overall dipole moment because they cancel each other out. So it's equally strong in both directions. So nothing happens. It's like kind of like um, if you have two cars um, trying to pull a central car, um, but they're moving at the same speed with the same force, the car doesn't actually move, nothing moves. We're just sitting there um, doing nothing. It's kind of a similar process, like pulling in both directions at the same time. Or if you tug a war and you're pulling the rope and both teams have the same strength, then nothing happens, it doesn't move. Um, so generally, whenever we're looking at solution forming and dissolving something in something else, um, we're looking to see if their um, type is similar. So we have this sort of saying that like dissolves like. So that means polar things dissolve polar things, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if we think about oil and water, they don't mix terribly well. And that's because water is a polar molecule, meaning that there is a, a more negative and a more positive region of that molecule. And oil, however, is nonpolar because there are no sort of um, significant areas of negative charge and no significant areas of positive charge. Uh, ethanol and water do mix, i.e. vodka and cranberry juice, or you could have um, your hand sanitization alcohol is usually about 70% ethanol uh, by volume. So that's the other 30% typically just water. Sometimes it's mixed in there a little bit of glycerol or something to act as a sort of uh, moisturizing agent. Uh, here we have, and we can see um, just how these electron clouds exist around different molecules and vary depending on the electronegativity of the atoms involved in a particular bond. So bond polarity and electronegativity. As the difference in electronegativity increases, i.e. this delta chi, so does the ionic character of the bond. So increasing covalent character is whenever we have lower values of chi, and as we increase the values of chi, we end up with increasing ionic character. So um, with H2, we have two of the same atom, which are involved in a bond, and um, their electrons are shared equal. They have a chi value of zero because both of them have the same um, electronegativity, 2.2, and so they pull on the electrons to the same extent, and we end up with um, a totally covalent bond. Uh, if, however, we have um, a significant difference between the, the electronegativities of the two atoms, like, for example, hydrogen and fluorine, we'll end up with um, a larger value of delta chi, which means it will be moving into the realm of a relatively polar covalent bond. Now, the electrons are still formally shared between the two atoms, and so we don't have electron transfer, but uh, we do now have this imbalance of the electron cloud. We have this slightly positive area here, this delta positive, and we have a slightly negative area here, this delta negative. Then, um, as we go across, then we have the Delta chi, um, whenever we have totally ionic character, such as this lithium fluoride, we see that we have uh, a very high value of delta chi. We end up with a more or less complete electron transfer. We now have ions, a negatively charged one, the cation, or anion, and a positively charged one, the cation. A difference in electronegativity of zero indicates that the bond is purely covalent. There is equal sharing of electrons. A difference of electronegativity between 0.1 to 0.3 indicates that the bond is nonpolar covalent. 
A difference of electronegativity between 0 0.4 to 1.7 indicates the bond is polar covalent. And a difference of electronegativity that is greater than 1.8 indicates that the bond is ionic. So um, really the ranges are sort of like 0, um, 0 to about 0 0.4 um, to 1.8 to 4. Um, so this is uh, purely covalent. This is polar covalent. And this is ionic. So there's complete electron transfer in this region. Um, but as I said, whenever you're at these boundaries like 0 0.4 or 1.8, it's, it's not necessarily true that it immediately becomes ionic at 1.8. There can still be some character which is covalent. Um, things like uh, HF, um, hydrogen and fluorine bonds, they seem to be ionic from an electronegativity difference, but they do have significant covalent character and that indicates that there is still some sharing of those electrons. And that will form the basis of some interesting acid base behavior that you will see in Gen Chem 2. So the overall polarity in molecules, uh, the polarity of the individual bonds in a molecule will determine the overall polarity of a molecule. A homonuclear diatomic molecule, homonuclear meaning the same nuclei are involved. So that's, for example, in this case, two iodines. Um, the diatomic molecules means there's two atoms, di meaning two atomic meaning atom, um, are nonpolar. And this is because they share the electrons very equally. Notice the symmetry of this molecule. Uh, when divided, the top and bottom, as well as the left and right, are mirrored, mirror images of each other. So these dashed red lines are the mirror images. So we can see that there is no real difference between one side and the other. One also knows the, mole the molecule is nonpolar because the bond is nonpolar. So you can see here that um, delta chi is equal to 2.7 minus 2.7, which is equal to zero. So we have no electronegativity difference, which means that the electrons are going to be shared perfectly equally between the two nuclei. And so we're not going to have any real uh, dipole moment or imbalance. There's going to be no slightly positive and no slightly negative. There's going to be no electron transfer. There's going to be no delta negative, no delta positive. That's not going to exist here for our homonuclear diatomic molecule iodine. Uh, other examples could be uh, chlorine, Cl2, um, nitrogen, N2, um, oxygen, O2, hydrogen, H2, and so on. Example HF, so as we talked about earlier, so um, hydrogen and fluorine, they have an electronegativity difference of 1.8. So, um, so delta chi is equal to 4.0 minus 2.2 is going to be equal to 1.8. All right. So the fluorine has a larger electronegativity value than hydrogen. This means that the electrons in the bond are skewed towards the F atom. The electrons shift toward the F atom. So we have a more positive end. This is going to be our delta positive end. And then we have our more negative end, which is going to be our delta negative end. Um, and so the difference in electronegativity polarizes the molecule. And this is why we have the sort of electron cloud um, becoming larger at the fluorine side and becoming smaller at the hydrogen side. Okay, so there is like a kind of small deficiency of electrons on the hydrogen side, even though the electrons are still shared, there's a slight deficiency. So they, they're not perfectly shared. And so that means that the electrons are more on the fluorine, which is why it is somewhat more negative. There are more electrons, electrons have negative charge. So the more electrons you have, the more negative it's going to be. And it's this sort of like imbalance between the two. It's all rather relative. So electronegativity, H versus F, the greater the difference in electronegativity, delta chi, the more polar the covalent bond. So hydrogen versus fluorine, 4.0 minus 2.2 is equal to 1.8. Um, carbon versus fluorine, so that's 1.5. Oxygen versus fluorine, that's 0 0.5. So in terms of polarity, the bond polarity is going to be highest for HF 
then for CF and then for OF. Right, so uh, molecular polarity must have polar bonds. So it depends on the molecular shape. Polar if centers of positive and negative charge are not the same. Bond polarity and molecular polarity. When a molecule possesses a net dipole moment, it is said to be polar. The individual OH bond dipoles result in a net or overall dipole moment for the molecule. So the bond dipole, uh, so the bond dipoles here point up towards actually where the lone pairs are, which is here and here. And so this region here becomes very much negative. Um, and this area becomes very much positive. And so that's why we have this like little arrow thing here, um, which is indicating the overall dipole moment of a molecule. So it's an arrow with a cross on one end, which indicates that that is the positive. End. So the molecule is therefore polar. So in chemistry, you always write it like this, where the arrow points towards the negative area. And we put a, a, like a sort of cross here where the positive part will be or the delta positive part in this case. So it's delta positive here around the hydrogens and delta negative here around the oxygen. Um, notice also that the molecule symmetry can be broken along either OH bond axis. So um, this is what this dash line is here. So this side um, does not look like this side. So whenever there exists a line or plane of asymmetry, the molecule is going to be polar. Um, sometimes, even though we have bond dipole moments, we don't actually have a molecular dipole. And a great example of this is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has two carbon oxygen bonds. So the carbon oxygen bond um, is a double bond in carbon dioxide. So each carbon oxygen bond is going to be polar because um, oxygen is has a high oxygen is equal to 3.5 and carbon is so high carbon is equal to 2.5. I think it's 2.5. It is 2.5. It's equal to 2.5. Um, which means that our delta chi is going to be equal to 1.0. 3.5 minus 2.5 is 1. So that means that the bond here is going to be polar. The positive part is going to be the carbon, and the negative part is going to be the oxygen. But since these dipoles point in, opposite, in perfectly opposite directions, because it's a linear molecule, if we recall to the previous um, parts of this module, we talked about molecular shapes. This is a linear molecule, meaning that the bond pairs have 180 degrees between them. It means that the dipole moments, since they have the same magnitude, because they're both carbon and oxygen, remember, so they both have this sort of similar magnitude of their dipole moments, they cancel each other out. It's uh, delta chi is one in the direction going to the left. And then it is also one going in the opposite direction. So it's going to be one minus one, which is equal to zero. So there is no overall dipole moment. So here is a sort of a summary table of different dipole moments, usually given the letter mu here um, of selected molecules in Debye units. Debye units is the capital D, it's the magnitude of a dipole moment. So um, the molecule AX, so for example, HF, HCl, HBr, HI, H2, we see the dipole moments change. Um, so the dipole moments get low, smaller, sorry, as we go down in the group 7A. So each fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all halogens, they're all in group 7A. Um, but this is an indication and shows us um, something that we should realize that in fact, dipole, or sorry, <clears throat> electronegativities decrease going down the group. And so as we go down the group, so do the molecular dipole moments because hydrogen stays the same, still 2.2, but the value of the halogen decreases. They all have a linear geometry, um, but their dipole moments decrease. And obviously hydrogen being a homonuclear diatomic molecule has a dipole moment of zero. Um, here we have a bunch of AX3 molecules. We have ammonia, we have NF3, and we have um, trifluoroborium here. 
So um, their different molecular geometries mean that they have different dipole moments. So both ammonia and NF3 are trigonal bipyramidal, which means oh, they also have a lone pair, don't forget, um, which on the nitrogen. And so they will have a dipole moment because their geometry is trigonal pyramidal. Um, then for BF3, it is trigonal planar. And so all of the bonds are 120 degrees apart. They all point in the same plane, like it's a planar molecule, so it's kind of flat. Um, and so that means that all the dipole moments are equally spaced out. They are the same magnitude because all the bonds are boron PF bonds. And so that means that the dipole moment overall will be zero. And we can see that also for um, some others here, the AX2 and the AX4. And you can sort of think about each one of these and try and sort of rationalize it for yourself. Bond and molecular polarity then. So here we can see BF3, we can see Cl2CO, and we can see uh, ammonia. So BF3 here um, has no net dipole moment because we can see the dipole moments here given their um, characteristic symbol, this arrow with a cross on the end. And then so delta positive in the middle, delta negative on each of the ends. So this is, if we add it all up, this will be three delta positive. And then there are three delta negatives, one, two, three. And so we have zero overall dipole moment. Now, this doesn't mean that certain parts of the molecule are not going to have higher electron density than others. That's not true to do. But the overall dipole moment of the, of the molecule is non-existent for BF3 because the negative charge in the fluorine atoms is distributed symmetrically. So the molecular dipole is zero. But if we look at things like um, Cl2O, uh, Cl2CO or NH3, um, we see that there is a net dipole moment um, because the negative charges are not distributed symmetric uh, or perfectly symmetrically over the molecule. So um, in Cl2CO and NH3, the negative charge on the molecules is shifted to one side and the positive charge to the other side. So the molecules are polar. The positive charges are um, the oxygens, or sorry, the hydrogens in ammonia. It's positive. And then the uh, negative part is on the nitrogen. And then in the case of uh, Cl2CO, we have a more polarity here than we do pointing down. And so we end up with a somewhat polar molecule um, with the overall dipole moment pointing up and pointing up, with uh, ammonia being more polar than uh, Cl2CO. Uh, dipole moments and molecular polarity. So here we see um, ammonia here on the left. We have C different um, like numbers of chlorine um, substitution. Uh, we have methane and then we have going all the way through um, the dichloromethane, which is a common solvent through to uh, tetrachloric uh, Carbon, tet carbon tetrachloride. So this is um, common nonpolar solvent. And then this one is um, chloroform. So uh, this one is nonpolar because all of the bonds have the same dipole moment, but they all are distributed symmetrically. And so there's no overall dipole moment. The same happens here for the chlorine, the CCL4, because even though all the bonds are now more polar than they were at the start, we end up with um, no net dipole moment. Um, then, as, but as we change one at a time, we see that we do introduce dipole moments. So for example, this one has the largest dipole moment and then um, it points up through the CCL bond. Then for the dichloromethane, it points between the two CCL bonds. And then um, for the chloroform, it points uh, with a positive part um, at the hydrogen and it points through to the space between the different uh, CCL bonds. So some examples then are hydrogen H2. This is a non-polar bond. Non-polar bonds only, it's a non-polar molecule. And this is because the electrons are shared equally between the two hydrogen atoms. It's totally covalent bond um, because there's no difference in the electronegativity of either hydrogen. So they share the electrons equally. Uh, there's gonna be no dipole moment. There's gonna be 
um, no overall molecular dipole moment either. However, if we have HCl, then we have a polar bond because the hydrogen is less electronegative than the chlorine. The chlorine is more electronegative. So chi here is going to be larger than chi here. Hydrogen is what, 2.2, chlorine is somewhere around about 3.8, I think. So we're going to have about 1.6 thereabouts of uh, delta electronegativity, delta chi, um, which means that this will be a polar bond, but it will still be covalent. A uh, polar bond, polar molecule, CO2 has two polar bonds. Like, so both of these bonds are, are polar, um, but overall the molecule is nonpolar because they point in opposite directions. So they cancel each other out. Uh, the relationship between molecular geometry and dipole moment then. So um, for a linear molecule like AX, so that could be HCl, for example, um, you get a linear structure. The dipole moment can be zero. For AX2, where X is the same, so that's our carbon dioxide, CO2, um, the structure is linear as well. Um, and the dipole moment is zero because um, the two bonds are the same, that X here is the same. Um, and so the dipole moment here will be zero. Um, if it's a bent geometry, much like water, then it can be zero, but it's not always going to be zero. Um, AX3, a trigonal planar structure is going to be zero. So that's like BF3. Um, it has polar bonds, but it's a nonpolar molecule. Uh, trigonal uh, bipyr or trigonal pyramidal, it can be zero, and T-shaped, it can also be zero. So um, trigonal pyramidal is something like NH3, and then T-shaped would be like our CLF3 that we saw before. The, they can have zero dipole moments, but it's not guaranteed. Um, tetrahedral then uh, structures these AX4. It will be zero because each AX bond is the same. So example would be a CH4 or methane. Um, we can also have square planar, that will be zero. Um, seesaw can also be zero if uh, depending on the groups that are involved. Uh, AX5 then, so this is trigonal planar, um, is going to be zero. Um, and then uh, square planar is going to be um, this is trigonal bipyramidal, sorry, uh, or square planar, um, square based pyramid. So they, these can both be zero. And octahedral then can also be zero. So this is trigonal pyramidal, this one, and this one is square based pyramid. So remember what we said about polarity. If lone pairs are around the central, if there are lone pairs around the central atom, it will be considered to be polar. In the case of xenon trifluoride, the dipoles do in fact cancel or xenon tetrafluoride. So we did xenon tetrafluoride's Lewis structure before. Um, just if we recall, it had xenon here and then it had um, a lone pair above, a lone pair below, and then it had all of the fluorines on a plane around the xenon. Uh, so each one of these bonds is polar, and um, it does have uh, a lone two lone. It does have a lone pair on the central atom, which would um, mean that we would be considering it to be polar. But this is an exception because the dipole moment points this way, or sorry, the lone pair points this way, the lone pair points that way, and those cancel each other out. And then the xenon fluoride bonds, um, they're also canceling out in a similar way to carbon dioxide. Then um, some important examples, water is super duper important in our uh, daily lives. It has polar bonds. So it has oxygen here, it has hydrogen here. So uh, oxygen's um, electronegativity is 3.5. Uh, the one for hydrogen is 2.2. So the, um, these, both of these bonds are polar. Um, the dipole moment for the bonds point along the bond. So generally um, what we have is a more negative area at the top. So this is going to be delta negative. And then at the bottom we have delta positive. Okay. We have polar bonds, which I've just shown you. We have a bent molecular shape, which I've also just shown you. And that's due to the lone pairs. 
Um, so it has four, for its electron domains, it has four ED, but only two bond pairs, two lone pairs, um, two bonding pairs, two lone pairs. So it has a, a tetrahedral um, electron domain geometry, but a bent uh, molecular geometry. And then it is a polar molecule because it has a lot of negativity up in this part and a lot of positivity down here. The overall dipole moment then goes like this between the hydrogens through the oxygen. Uh, you can demonstrate this if you have like a, a plastic rod or something, um, you can rub it on some uh, cloth. Um, if you rub it fast enough, you can uh, charge it with static electricity. And then if you try to bring it close to the surface of water or cyclohexane, um, you will see different um, behavior. The water will attra be attracted to the rod whereas in the cyclo case of the cyclohexane, it will move away from the rod. Um, you could potentially also do this. Um, Try to think what could be in your home that you could do this with. Uh, motor oil, if you could find motor oil, but please be very careful with those sorts of things. Um, microwave oven then. Um, so the, the basis of a microwave oven is that the frequency of uh, the microwaves inside the oven. So a microwave is a form of electromagnetic radiation that we learned about back in module two. Um, what it's doing is, a, it is at the correct frequency to cause um, the water molecule to rotate. So what's happening whenever you're turning on your microwave oven is that the energy from the microwaves is making water in your food rotate. Um, and that rotation is causing an increase in energy. It increases the temperature. And that's why the food cooks. Um, Non-polar things like uh, nitrogen and oxygen and air are not effective. Um, they don't uh, interact with the microwaves. Okay, so here's some, um, well, it's easier to do it at your desk and share with your neighbor. I would encourage you to sort of do it yourself on a piece of paper and think about it. If you have a, a study friend or whatever, then you can also do it with them. So predict the shape and molarity or, and polarity of the uh, examples that I'm gonna give you down below here. So um, is it gonna be apolar where the dipole moment mu is not equal to zero, or is it gonna be nonpolar where mu is equal to zero? So we have PCL3 versus BCL3. Um, so think about those structures. Um, do out the Lewis structures, and that can help you as well. PCL5 versus um, SBCL5 two minus, um, SF4, versus uh, ICL4 minus, CLF3 versus uh, xenon difluoride, um, CCL4 versus SF6. And um, try to predict which one is going to be polar, which one's not going to be polar. If you're not quite sure of the structures, um, some of the structures like, for example, um, these two, um, we did already in our uh, earlier lectures. Um, some of the others we haven't done yet, but just try to find them on the periodic table, do your usual sort of uh, steps for Lewis diagrams, see which one's polar, which one's non-polar. Um, it will be helpful.